Okay, is this thing? Okay, is this thing working? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I'm a little more soft spoken, so I like to use the mic. Is this oh. is working again? Did you pull it out? No, it's good. Okay. okay, well, if it stops working, I'll just yell louder, but um, I prefer not to yell. So I'm going to use the mic. Um, so my name is Aaron Chomland. I'm the uh, Upper Coast Project Director office here with him um, at Tech City Prayer Preserve. So um, I want to talk uh, today a little bit about some of our restoration efforts over the past three years or so, three, four years, um, kind of how that's evolved and, and where that's going to be going in the next uh, next few years. So, um, OK, so as Jeff mentioned, we, we acquired this property in about 1995. It's a 2300 acre uh, coastal tall grass prairie preserve. Um, it was a formerly a working ranch at one time. so. Um, you can see the evidence of that and also uh, a lot of former and a little bit of current oil and gas activity, um, which is all that combined has led to um, about 10 to 15 percent of the preserve in need of active restoration. And by that, I mean replanting. Um, just the, the plant community is just, just not there. The seed bank's not there anymore. So the only way to get back into a tall grass prairie is through a replanting effort. So. Um, at the time, um, early on, we really didn't have a lot of information about how to go about this. Um, there wasn't um, a lot of venues like this to, to get together, share information. Um, we really didn't have a lot of guidance. So we just kind of used a few basic uh, principles based on farming, um, which is if you have good soil, you have good seed, you have a good seed bed, you put all this together, you know, something's, something's bound to happen. I mean, we can't control the weather. Uh, but we can control um, some of those variables. And so, um, and so that's what we did. And uh, we didn't really know how it was going to turn out. Um, we knew there was going to be a lot of challenges come up, but we trusted that we could just we could figure out the rest along the way. We didn't know how invasive species were going to respond. We didn't know how the weeds were going to respond. We didn't know, you know, we just kind of jumped into it. Um, fortunately, we do have good soils for the most part on a lot of the area here, um, loam to clay loam. Uh, soils is, are pretty characteristic of most of the preserve here. A um, few pockets of sand every every once in a while, um, but soil, soil horizons were largely intact. Um, it still had that nice top la top soil layer, um, but it just was characteristic was a lot of disturbed vegetation, a lot of annual um, native annuals, um, non-native perennials, uh, particularly smut grass, deep rooted sedge. Um, you know, there's a host of others out there, but um, and that's that's very characteristic of a lot of uh, rangeland in this area. So the, the geology may still be intact, the soils may still be there, but there's no um, above ground or very little above ground semblance of a of a native prairie left. Um, fortunately, in, what we had in favor is that we had a lot of good steady rainfall um, since we started. Uh, so really no uh, very few to no extended dry periods. Um, so a couple things we have going for us is that we really have a lot of great prairie preserves in the area. As, as Jeff mentioned, um, this we have a lot of great prairie here at Texas City Prairie Preserve. Um, hope you get to see a little bit of it today. Um, the Nash Prairie Preserve, um, Billy, Billy Ward manages that for us now. Um, that's a great asset for us. Even the, the Mad Island Marsh Preserve, T Stephen's not here today, but uh, we've harvested a lot of seed off of that. So we've really had a lot of, of great resources here to, to help us in this process. Um, and we really st we started with a series of real small um, pilot projects. Uh, we wanted to start small. We didn't know what was going to work. We didn't know um, if it was going to work. So we just wanted, we wanted to start small. Um, but it allowed us to really develop some research questions, um, gain knowledge, and learn, learn lessons from, uh, from those small areas before we got larger, and, uh, and just really understand the tools involved. Um, and then also at the same time, slowly begin, although albeit small, uh, small pieces, slowly begin this process of restoring that two to 300 acre target at, here at the preserve. And then um, also allow us to uh, leverage what we learn. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll get that in a minute. So it started off real small, 
got a little bit bigger, so I'll, I'll get into that just in a second. Um, but it, allow, it also allows us to leverage the information that we gain on a small scale um, to, to promote grassland restoration through venues like this. So sharing this information is important to us. Um, we want everybody to be, everyone who wants to be, wants to do restoration, we want to help them be successful. Um, because the more people who are successful, the more people doing it, it creates, um, creates more energy, creates more of a market for seeds. Um, and so it just creates a lot of good, good momentum in the area. So, uh, so this is actually the, the beginning. Um, this was right out here. Um, used to be an old horse pasture when, uh, you know, Tim remembers that six, seven years ago. Uh, the rancher just had his, his horse out there in the pen. So, uh, all as you can imagine, you know, horse pasture, all uh, pretty bad weeds. Um, but again, the, the soil was there. So, we, we dissed that up, got a nice, good, clean seed bed marked off. I think it's a start off with nine or 10 20 by 20 foot plots. Um, so, just stake those out, uh, put the seed down. Um, you know, this, this was December 2015. Uh, so we had just collected a bunch of uh, brown seed past palum here on the preserve. So we thought, well, let's throw that in there, see what that does. Uh, we'd harvest that fall, we'd harvested some little blue stem mix. So yeah, let's try that too. We'll see. Um, so the next, next spring, um, weeds came up. This is mostly Western, Western ragweed and some others. Um, this is pretty typical. Um, so we kind of kept that mowed down until we saw uh, grasses coming up. So this was um, spring 2016, and then by 2017, it looked like this. It was pretty much solid little blue stem. So that the brown seed past battle might actually come up that first year, and it was pretty much solid. Second year, it gave way to the brown seed past palum and, uh, and a host of others. And uh, so at that point, it was pretty much a mature restoration. So, um, so some lessons here, again, that brown seed established really well. Um, little blue, late successional stuff came on later, year two. Um, tried some, a little bit of forbs. We, we had some American basket flowers, so let's try that. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yell louder. Sorry, can you hear me in the back, Lynn? Okay. Um, so we tried a few forbs. Um, some of those did okay. Um, weed control was really the big issue, so we had to do, take steps for that. Uh, mowing is typically what we did. Um, we tried to we try to cover crop that didn't really work. Um, could have been the planting timing or something else. Uh, but one one big lesson for us was really to try to tighten up. Uh, yep. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So year one would have been 2016, and then year two is 2017. It's kind of the way I'm way I'm uh, classifying that. <laughs> but, um, but one of the biggest lessons for that. Uh, process was hey, we really need to tighten up the planting rates because um, of those 10, I would say two and a half were successful. Um, so most of them didn't, most of them failed. And so the lesson was, and I didn't know, I didn't know really why they failed. Um, could have been, uh, you know, the, the side character, I don't know, could have been anything. And um, what I didn't know was what, how, how much seed we put in and what the quality of that seed was. So it introduced another unknown variable in there that I wasn't able to account for. And so really kind of a lesson for me was, was, you know, what kind of seed are you putting in the ground and, and try to try to quantify that and understand that. So, um, so then we, we found some success on a small scale. So I was, okay, let's get bigger. Um, and so we tried, uh, uh, I think our first one was a quarter acre we, and we've planted, um, every spring and fall since then. So, um, we've had probably just getting ready to put on our eighth, um, eighth restoration planning. So uh, we do a little bit every spring and fall. And so that really allows us to kind of um, gain some lessons from, from what we're doing. Um, this was one of the uh, ones, I think this was two, two years ago. Um, so fall 2016. And this is pretty much what it looked like going in. Just uh, this is kind of a winter photograph, but just smut grass and deep rooted sedge. Nothing really great there. Um, I think this is an old photo from like 2007 solid deep rooted sedge um, and we're able to get rid of the deep rooted sedge just by glyphosate uh, but then we're just left with a lot of um, a, you know a lot of native annuals um, no no bunch grasses to speak of um, so not really a you know even though we got rid of the sedge it really wasn't what we wanted 
Um, this was after a little bit of ditch work in that area, um, 2013. Um, and they actually took out some of the dirt and they wanted to know what to do with that. So, well, just kind of make a, make a ridge in the middle, you know, and so that's what they did. That's what that, that line is in the center. They just kind of put the dirt from the ditch in there. But this is pretty much what it looked like going in. Um, so 2016 is when we planted. <clears throat> um, we used this little uh, lime spreader for most of it. Uh, we did some by hand as well. Um, this, this was the mix of seeds we put in. And you could pretty much see, if you go out there to now, which uh, if you come out with the tour, you'll see it. But um, every single one of those grasses you can see out there right now. Um, the forbs were a little bit trickier. So the forbs, um, we've had a little bit of Indian plantain and coneflower, but I really haven't been able to get the Battlesec Master or the Gay Feather come up yet. And I think that might just be a management thing. It might need a burn or, or, or something to push that up. So, um, so one thing we learned was that the, and we do a fall planting, disturb the ground in the fall, cool season non-natives become an issue. So we had things like Timothy grass, uh, rabbit foots grass, um, maybe even annual ryegrass um, coming up in the, in the late winter, early spring. So we had to mow that off. Um, now I was really getting discouraged because then as we mowed that off, you know, more weeds came up and uh, I really wasn't seeing a lot of germination of anything. Um, and so we kind of had this basically weed stand and eventually I did, so we got some rain and, and some things started kind of coming up in that, within that sump weed, which is what you're seeing here. Uh, but sump weed was really becoming a problem. So, um, you know, we need to do something with it before it, it got up over the grass uh, seedlings and, and shaded them out. So uh, we decided to go ahead and try to, uh, and go ahead and spray it. We use an herbicide called Weed Master. So the advantage of that is that it, it will kill the, the um, all your broadleafs, but then also will kill deep-rooted sedge. So um, it's kind of a one-two punch. We thought, you know, some advantages to, to, if any sedge was coming back, we could take care of that at the same time. So this was, um, this would have been June. This was July, um, August. So um, all the weeds are going back and kind of see the effects of hand planting. We kind of missed a lot of areas. That's, that's all brown seed phaspalum for the most part um, coming up. And so you kind of see the areas we missed with planting by hand. Uh, but the grass really started flushing up at that point. And this is September. So at that point, it's pretty much 100% um, native early successional cover at that point. And, uh, and then year two, you kind of see what's happening year two. If you go out there, it's actually starting to give way now to the late successional stuff. So, um, so again, it's, it, this very, um, and then I think, see that there's a, there's a rainbow in the background. So that's, that's when we knew we succeeded when it was that saw the rainbow and okay, we, we, we succeeded here. So, um, but some lessons from this, you know, the, from, from all this work we've been doing out here, uh, fall or spring planting, both been successful with rain. Um, the cool season weeds were, were a problem with the fall uh, ground disturbance. <clears throat> Brown seed paspalum again was the strongest performer in year one um, for the early native cover. Um, and, and some of our planters, we've had a solid uh, stand of brown seed paspalum seeding out in four months. Uh, th those are our spring planting. So that's what good temperatures and rainfall will do for you. Can really, really push up a good, a good stand of it. Um, long spike tritons also did very well in year one, although a little bit later. Um, in the gaps where the brown seed was not planted, you'll see a lot more diversity actually. Um, long spike established well, and you see the late successional stuff actually started kind of coming up a little bit in year one in, in those areas. So that was kind of a lesson as far as what the, what the brown seed is, is doing. Uh, brown seed is really kind of stabilizing effect. It really holds the uh, plant community there for a while. Um, so it may or may not be a desirable trait. You know, if you want more, uh, more diversity early, maybe you want to back off on the brown seed. So uh, we're kind of going to be testing that here um, sometime in the near future. Uh, gaping panicum and not root bristlegrass responded well from the seed bank. They kind of filled in a, little, a lot of the gaps as well. Um, annual weed establishment was the biggest issue um, that we faced in year one. So uh, with that steady rainfall, that wasn't a problem, but the, you know, that weeds came up really thick and it's really important to do something about those. Um, otherwise you, get, you risk losing, uh, losing your whole stand of seedlings. Um, 
even after that herbicide treatment. So the, the reason we decided there, the herbicide with Weedmaster, we didn't see a lot of our perennial forbs coming up. We didn't see any seedlings. So we thought, okay, well, we might be safe to, to apply this and, and maybe those, think those perennials will come back later. And sure enough, that's what happened. Uh, we're able to get those annual weeds off and then the perennial stuff um, came up later in the year after that was, that was gone. Um, so just in summary of the, some of the past restoration efforts here leading up to last three years here, um, we've really established a reliable uh, practice for establishing um, the stands of a, a stable prairie, um, at least grassland community, a grass dominated community. Um, involves preparation, planning, weed management, stand establishment, and stand management eventually after, after the project's mature. Um, you know, nearly 100% cover of native early successional, sometimes within three months um, if we have good weather and, and good rain. Uh, but it really does take about two or three years to fully mature. Um, I would say your, your stable late successional grass community is about year two or three is when that's going to happen. Um, and we found also through some rate experiments, we're, you know, we're, we're adjusting the rates. We're kind of playing with that now. And right now we found that we can be successful as low as 20 PLS per square foot, uh, possibly lower. We're gonna try, uh, try working lower rates even in the near future. We started off with like, we started off with 80, just to give you some context. Went down to 40, that was still doing okay. And now it's, I think we can do even 20 or lower, so. Sorry, what's PLS? I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, pure PLS is pure live seed, so it's a it's a calculation. Um, if you have a, a, a sample of seed, it's your purity times your germination. Um, yeah, purity times germination. So, um, how pure the seed is, and then how the quality of the seed, what actually germinates, um, those two combined, is gives you your PLS. So. Um, so ongoing work. Um, we're, we're starting some stand. We're starting to do some stand, stand establishment without using herbicides, uh, or at least minimal, um, just for the prep part of it. Um, so no, no weed master during the during the establishment phase, just mowing. Um, now one disadvantage of this, we have to mow. We had last year, this year with all the rain, we've had to mow four times, and so that's you know, getting in the field of the tractor four times versus one or two with with herbicide, you know. Um, but there is some advantage. Um, the um, compared to the sprayed plots, there's there's much less grass cover after year one because of all that competition. But you also have a lot more forb germination, uh, which we'll see if we go out there. So there's a lot ton of Texas cone flower coming up in there, which I'd never seen before. Um, so I think that's that's a product of not having that you know 100% grass cover um, over everything year 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 round. So um, so if forbs what you're after, maybe this is a better way to do that. Um, again, sump weed was the main weed, and uh, finally after that fourth time of mowing, I think we had to mow sump weed three times, but after that third time, that finally gave up and, and was gone. So um, it, was, it was mowed close to the flowering period. So if you mow it early, it'll come right back, but then you can mow it close to the flowering period and it finally gives up and, and uh, gives away to the grasses. So, um, Oh, so some ongoing future work here going on. Um, so we're always trying to add form diversity, and uh, Billy's been been a big help with that. Always harvesting more species every year, um, adding more species to the mixes, um, and that's the result of, of aggressive prairie management that we've been do been doing at here and at uh, Nash Prairie and, and Matt Island as well. Uh, that aggressive prairie management through fire, uh, prescribed fire, through great um, through mowing, some other mechanical means, has really allowed those those uh, forbs to germinate in the, in the big area sometimes and allows us to get our machine on it and collect a lot of seeds. So, so we're continuing to add more, more um, species to the mix. Um, and then now we're trying methods of establishing larger, a larger forb community. So um, trying to, whether it through stand management, through the prescribed burning, um, mowing, I think we can get up some of those forbs in the seed bank that haven't come up yet. Uh, but also the planting methods I mentioned. So maybe backing off a little bit on the the brown seed pass palum or that early, early cover um, might, be, might be a way to do that as well. Um, and we're also trying to address some very specific forb availability issues um, using increased plots. This is something volunteers have just started helping us with. Um, some of those forbs that are hard to get after in the field sometimes, um, we're gonna try to grow those out here in the, the seed plot. 
see if we can't get an efficient method of growing a lot of seed, um, which, which would then take the burden off of having to go out in the prairie and get it all the time. We could just do it right here. Um, so again, we're starting small with that. Hopefully it will get bigger if it's successful. So, and then another thing we're going to try this year is it's just, it's overseeding. So try it without tilling, um, seeing how that does as well. So, um, if we can do it without tilling, you know, obviously breaking the ground causes a lot of weed flush. So there may be some advantages to, um, to not having to till as well. So, um, so that's basically the work going on, um, in a nutshell here. And hopefully you'll join us on one of the tours. So as Jaime mentioned, we got two tours, um, one at 10 and one at one, I believe. Uh, there'll be an hour and uh, they're both the same. So um, you can choose one or the other or just stay here for the talks. Uh, it's up to you. Um, and so with that, I want to turn it over to Tim. Um, Tim's got a uh, going to introduce us some of the uh, brush control methods that we've used and how that how the prairies responded to that. So. Is there a pointer? I have one now. A test, a test. Uh, I'm fine talking. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Where's our uh, laser pointer? No, I mean the, uh, yeah, there is one. With, this is ours. It's okay. in the bag. You didn't bring the bag over? Okay. Hello, everybody. My name's Tim O'Connell. I'm the preserve steward for this property. Uh, I stepped foot on it 12 years ago as a volunteer and been employed here for the last 10 years. Uh, when I started here, of course, it was uh, all chicken, prairie chicken oriented. Uh, worked at that for four or five years and uh, really enjoyed the work. Uh, we quit releasing them here about six years ago and uh, they only live about three years. And of course, without the re released birds being reintroduced, uh, eventually just they only live three years. So I knew they were going to die out. I could give a whole talk on that later. This talk is about uh, a restoration. This is a restoration roundup, kind of a pet project I've had the last two years of uh, restoration of a tallow forest, converting it back to native prairie. Red button right there at the top. Oh, that's my, uh, okay. Yeah, it's uh, 2,300 acres. We're right here. This is the test area. This was heavily impacted by uh, oil use, overgrazing, and pretty much ruined the prairie that was here. Uh, the oil companies put in roads where they blocked the sheet flow and the weight of the water just changed the complete plant community. This is the sort of areas where uh, the drastic restoration that Aaron's talking about, where you pretty much have to start from scratch, that's where that methodology comes in. To redo the whole rangeland in, in such a way as putting the plants back in would be pretty hard to do. So this is our test area, and I got to tell the story. I'm going to tell the story of this little 10-acre plot right here. Uh, the reserve was purchased in 1995. Uh, about 10 years later, we acquired 10 acres that were outside of the boundary, our fence line of the property that was not impacted by overgrazing not impacted by the oil field, but it had no management done to it at all for 15, 20 years. If you look at it today, you can pretty much tell our property line by looking at the tallow trees all the way down the west side. So it was a perfect example for me to establish a methodology for converting a tallow forest back to prairie. Uh, as a prairie steward, I've got four main tools that I use for uh, the rangeland of the coastal prairie. One being uh, prescribed fire, very effective. Uh, it's difficult to implement here because of the urban interface with Texas City, the highway, and a few other things, so it's, it's problematic to do. Uh, the other one is mechanical means, which is a tractor and a shredder. 
Uh, another tool that I have is herbicides, which is a useful tool if used correctly in certain areas. It, it is, definitely is. And the other one is biological means. And that is, it's nothing weird, it's just cattle or uh, goats or some sort of uh, creature that eats grasses. Actually, it is, can provide uh, beneficial use to the prairie. So this particular one here, uh, I'm going to give you a timeline. Uh, I'm going to use, it's sort of a combination of both. In this one here, I used uh, herbicide and mechanical means to try to reestablish the coastal prairie. There's a close-up of it. And again, all the work that we're doing today is all restored. We got restoration plots all out in here. Uh, this is uh, to get you oriented when you get out on the tour. This parking lot is the old... Uh, tank battery from the oil field and uh, it just makes a really good place for storage equipment and parking. So we come out here, our restoration plots that Aaron has reseeded and with the, as you can kind of see right on here, it's all these areas here, here, this was a big one. All this area was nothing but deep rooted sedge, sump weed, uh, pretty much worthless ground cover. So that area we had to reseed. This 10 acres that we acquired was outside of our boundary. <clears throat> it's a little bit different story. It had just overgrown with tallow trees. So uh, in my practice of uh, rangeland management, here's a picture of what it looked like. Here's our property here. Here's across the fence. This is a property that we had for a good 10 years, and it never reached the uh, threshold of being a priority. We got a grant from Dr. Pepper, who came in with a, uh, Sonia and Aaron were instrumental. Here's some more of the, what this looked like. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. All right, so this is an example of what the tallow forest looked like. Dr. Pepper uh, was good to us with a, Nice grant, and Sonia and Aaron were able to work out uh, a contract with a company out of Arkansas with this hydro axe. I was dumb. I thought hydro doesn't that mean water. No, it's hydraulic. It's a hydraulic grinder in front of this. It's almost the size of a bull, big bulldozer, and this thing spins around really quick and just takes an instant to get rid of a tallow tree. Previously, when I was working on the prairie, I'd have to go out there and do a hack and squirt each individual tree. It just took forever. And so we had to use mechanical means. So the first step is just remove the tallow with this hydro axe. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, and this my other piece of equipment is a tractor. This is the herbicide part, what is called a weed wiper. Previously, I would use, after mowing an area and I wanted to get, remove the brush, I would use that piece of equipment back there as a boom sprayer. It did a good job of getting rid of the uh, brush, but there was collateral damage in the forbs, and that got to be problematic as well. Anyone who's worked on a range for a long time knows that you can get rid of this stuff, but the regrowth is the real problem. And trying to figure out how to deal with the regrowth is something I've struggled with for many years. And this is not the solution to all. It's a solution to this particular incident. Any piece of property is going to have to have a rangeland expert come up to it and almost like a doctor prescribe a treatment that it needs to get it back to coastal prairie. And this is another one through that I've experimented with and was able to implement. So now, instead of using a boom sprayer, spraying the chemical down all over the ground, this sprayer is, or it's not even a sprayer, it's like a big giant rolling pin with a carpet around it and it rolls. And I can adjust the height. And I've got, this happens to be Sysmania next to it. It's not uh, invasive, but it is an increaser, and it will just put off so much shade, it will actually kill off any grasses below it. So I try to get to this as much as I can. Mowing, of course, the seeds, it grows back. So the best thing to do is I can raise this up to the height above non-targeted species, and I'm hitting this. Uh, John Heron, our old uh, director of uh, conservation, used a beautiful term with it. He says, oh, so you're using the competitive advantage of brush against itself. And I thought about it. I said, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. So again, uh, this is, uh, here's the 10 acres right back here that you were looking at was 
is now a prairie that was looked like that. It was the area behind our 10 acres. Okay, kind of the sequence of happened here. We did the uh, hydro axe came in in uh, was that October, November of 2016. I remember it was the election year. Hydro axe came in. We took all the tallow trees, ground them up with the hydro axe. It came down to mulch. Just covering up the ground with a lot of that mulch helped with uh, some of the tallow kill, but still there was inevitable regrowth. So uh, this is what it looked like in the spring of 2017. See with all this tallow? It used to be big tall trees, ground them up. Now they're uh, coming back. But what happens is, using the competitive advantage of brush against itself, it gets about, it's like whack-a-mole almost, where it gets this much taller than the herbaceous growth below. And then you can use the weed wiper, and it rolls over the top of it, and it just coats the leaves. And it kills the, uh, particularly the brush that I'm after, which is tallow and the eastern backers. Here's the result. That same field, these are photo points I set up. Here it is with the regrowth. Here it is after I used the weed wiper on it. So we kill all the bacris, then I come back in and I mold the whole thing once again. Now I have the dead bacris without dealing with the regrowth, all the herbaceous growth that was there. It was an amazing thing about the tallow forest. I didn't have to reseed anything. It, just, it was there in the ground. It had a memory. The seeds were there. So it came back up. And as we go back out on the tour, I've got it set up out there, so I saved what it looks like now for y'all to go out there and look at it and go, huh. So just a simple sequence of hydroaxing. They were pretty expensive. It was, I don't know, 600 an hour or something. But he, he didn't just do that area. He did that area on the south side of the unit. Uh, he did about 300 acres altogether of tallow. And when they were gone, I didn't have a single tallow tree left on the property. But as you go out and look around, you'll see some of this regrowth coming back. And the object is a big, large-scale landscape like this. Sure, you make it one guy out there with a backpack sprayer. It's going to take forever to do it. So this mechanical means really makes it uh, quick work of some of these trees. So we're doing a really good job of knocking back uh, tallow and uh, backers. As a steward of a grassland program, I'm a steward of a grassland pro. I work for the grassland program, and my job as a grassland steward is to promote grassland. I'm not the steward of a brushland uh, preserve. So that's my way of thinking on that. And uh, I'll get to your question here in just a second. I just have one more slide, I think. That's what it looks like after I mowed it. After I killed the bacris, then I mowed it. It just opened up the ground cover, and all the seeds that were already in the ground without having to reseed, it came back. You go out there now and take a look at it, which I hope everyone will. Uh, it's all kinds of forbs, and uh, it's pretty good prairie. It's not like the Nash or anything, but it's still a nice chunk of prairie. So, and your question? No, on this one, I used uh, a 2,4-D and a Grazon Next. And as I work with this, uh, the benefits is, of course, I'm not going to be boom spraying all over the place, killing collateral damage. Uh, of course, the big cost savings because I'm only targeting the stuff up above. And so I'm still kind of experimenting with uh, the amounts, even the brands. I did another 100 acres out there with a different mixture, and I got a 50% kill on Bacris. Nothing wrong. I don't want to kill all the Bacris because the prairie needs it, but you don't need, if you, you know, it's just a tool that I use for, eliminating a lot of uh, brush. So, uh, maybe two to four. Yeah, we're still working on the, uh, just like we're working with the seed, you know, time of year, seed mixture and whatnot. Uh, the idea came to me from our colleagues in the uh, uh, Blackland Prairie. We have property there and uh, they use it for uh, Johnson grass. And uh, he said, don't use it on McCarty Rose because it'll tear up the carpet. Uh, I used it on 100 acres of Bacris. It didn't ruin the carpet, but it took a beating. But uh, I'm excited with the results, and uh, I hope to do more for kind of a large scale, larger scale restoration work. So is my card up there yet? 
Okay. All right. Another, yeah. Uh, when y'all vote, y'all set the deck at a lower, or what, what height do you set it at? Uh, the original mole was high, right after the roller chopper went in there, because I'm dealing with uh, stumps. Yeah. And then, uh, then I wait for the regrowth, and then I hit it with the weed wiper, and then I can go on a low set because the stumps have died, and I won't ruin the machinery with cutting it down. And then I'll wait for what comes up. And it was... Yeah, I, I mow it twice. I wait for the stumps to get killed from the uh, herbicide application. So if the stumps weren't there, you just mow it at a, at a low height? Right, yeah. Uh, the grinder did really good with getting down to the ground in a lot of spots, but you hit, uh, you hit a stump with a shredder, and no knowing it, you can uh, ruin a gearbox and things. So that's why I did it like that. <laughs>